Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's book talk hosted by the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. My name is Craig Willingham. I'm the managing director for the Institute. And the, for those of you who don't know, and if this is your first time attending one of our events, a little background on the Institute. We are a research and action center based at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And our work focuses on a wide variety of food policy related topic areas, everything from jobs in the food sector to the connections between upstate agricultural producers, downstate consumers. We do a lot of work looking at food and security, uh, jobs in the food sector and everything in between. And today's discussion is really a variation on some of the regular forms that we produce in the last year or so, we've decided to start mixing it up and doing a combination of forum discussions and book talks. And uh, today is an example of our uh, effort to lift up new publications by uh, authors whose work we think is important. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about the work later on. But before we get started, I want to mention a few upcoming events. Um, Rosita, I don't know if you can share the slide for our upcoming uh, events. Great, thank you. Uh, the first is on March 16th at 4 p.m. we'll be discussing visualizing school meal participation in New York City. In this session, participants will hear from researchers at our institute and invited guests, including community and parent advocates a student and other experts on how data from the NYC open portal platform were used to develop a dashboard prototype for visualizing school meal participation rates in New York City public schools. Our next event, uh, next slide please, uh, is a Grand Rounds event with Dr. Earl C. Chambers on April 13th, 2023 at 4 p.m. Earl Chambers is a professor in the Department of Family and Social Medicine, associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health, professor in the Department of Psychiat Psychiatry and Behavioral Science, and a director of the Department of Family and Social Medicine Research Division at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. His areas of research explore the intersection between social, epidemiological, and social medicine and how social, how social determinants of health within the context of physical environments can influence health behaviors and health outcomes in patients and populations. Next slide, please. And lastly, join us on April 27th at 10 a.m. for a book talk to discuss Eduardo J. Gomez's book, Junk Food Politics. In Junk Food Politics, Eduardo argues that the challenge lies with the strategic politics of, junk food, of the junk food industry and the way in which industry leaders have successfully created supportive political coalitions by partnering with governments to promote soda taxes, food labeling, and initiatives focused on public awareness and exercising while garnering presidential support Throughout the contributions of government and anti-hunger groups and other allied organizations are shown to have an unusual marriage of convenience in that ultimately much of the effort is done in the focus or with a, uh, an idea of supporting the junk food industry in a way that's counterintuitive to those sorts of entities. And so I'm hoping you can join us for uh, one or more of these events It'll be very lively, interesting, and hopefully um, will help to add to the understanding of the various topics. So moving on to today's event. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Na Oyo Kwate, the author of the book, White Burgers, Black Cash. This book is deeply insightful and is the exploration of the relationship between fast food restaurants and the African-American community. And it traces the evolution of fast food from its early days in the 1900s to its present day impact on black communities. As we all know, fast food restaurants have become a ubiquitous part of American culture. And they're often associated with convenience 
affordability and accessibility. However, what many people may not know is that the fast food industry has a long and pernicious history of racist exclusion and exploitation, particularly when it comes to African-Americans. White Burgers, White Cash delves deeply into this history, exploring the ways in which fast food companies have contributed to the economic and social marginalization of black communities while simultaneously profiting from their business. Please join me and welcome the author of this very timely and important book, Dr. Kotai. Thank you, Craig. Can you hear me? Everybody's and we're good with sound and everything? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you. So thanks very much for that introduction. And thanks to Rosita and everybody uh, at the Institute for uh, bringing me here today and uh, making this talk possible. So um, Craig just gave you a great <laughs> introduction to the book. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really looking at um, trying to trace this national story uh, from the early 1900s to the present, um, although with special attention to uh, Chicago, DC, and New York, and um, looking at how fast food changed from a posture of uh, excluding Black consumers, uh, operators, and neighborhoods to one that made uh, Blackness central uh, to the bottom line. And so in the book, I argue that fast food's posture has always been anti-Black, but that posture, the, you know, the nature of that anti-Blackness changed over time. So, you know, again, whereas in the beginning, it was uh, purely about uh, exclusion, that shifted and then became about disproportionality and, and exploitation. And so the nature, you know, the, the nature of that relationship to black communities changed, although it was always from a posture of anti-blackness. And so um, in this brief 20 minute period that I have to dis describe or discuss more of the book, you know, I can't really summarize a century of change in that time. So what I'm really gonna do is focus more on the earlier uh, part of that timeline, I think, because uh, it's one that people know less about. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, sort of skip ahead. So this is a, this is between like the 1920s and 1950s, and then um, I'm going to talk about and how whiteness figured in restaurant operations at that time, and then skip ahead to the late uh, 1960s and read an excerpt uh, from the book that's in that era. Uh, and so that this is chapter five, which is about a third of the way through the book, and then towards the end, close by you know just pointing out some of the uh, signal catalysts for fast foods uh, continuing racial transformation thereafter. So let me just say up front that you know it wasn't um, you know in in this transformation there was never a light switch that went on that caused fast food to shift abruptly from one minute you know utterly excluding black people to uh, pursuing them full throttle the next it wasn't it wasn't like that it took a long time again this is over a century um, and there's a lot of you know kind of approach avoidance and both there were both push and pull factors that uh, that caused fast food to proliferate uh, in black neighborhoods and so as these different forces were coming in and out of focus, the symbolic meanings of fast food were also changing alongside them. And so the, the, the portion that I'm talking about uh, is really in the era where fast food was a cipher for whiteness and the ways in which it was, sell, you know, it was selling a kind of uh, consumable whiteness and, and, and uh, fast food as health hygiene and uh, racial purity. And so what's interesting about fast food is that it has two opposing valuations, right? On the one hand, it's it's symbolic of, you know, uh, all American sort of happiness, the, the quintessential American meal, the national food. Uh, it's imbued with a good life or with convenience, as Craig had noted. And so, you know, it, it has those kind of, po po kind of positive connotations. But on the other hand, um, in a moment when organic food, artisanal locally produced food um, is in vogue, and those kinds of foods are held in high esteem, fast food then becomes saddled with, um, the power of being a homogenized kind of product, anachronistic, right, and out of step with, with the current um, uh, preferences. And plus fast food has lots of nutritional liabilities, high energy density, fat, sugar, and the like. And so so-called foodies um, generally reject fast food unless it takes the shape of um, a reinvented kind of form that, that, that explicitly caters to a new urban white affluence like Shake Shack. So in shifting to this new urban white aesthetic, um, upscale fast food like, like Shake Shack actually harkens to the beginnings uh, of the original restaurants that are now uh, considered passe. And when you think about most of its history, fast food's all American kind of stance, you know, really meant all American whiteness. So when you look at, for example, at, um, advertisements for the 1950s, um, you know, like if you, there, there are ads for KFC where they, they featured, um, like this happy little family with the dad and the, and the two kids and, this, and the whole thing. And everything about that was about 
making white kids, families, and communities really paradigmatic for, for citing fast food and for uh, marketing its products. And it's really quite you know, different from the kinds of advertisements you see today. And so now we're in a moment where fast food is strongly racialized as Black. It's disproportionately dense in Black neighborhoods, um, actively targets Black consumers, and also often uses Black folks or, or re relies on images of Blackness for its marketing. So if you think about, um, what's the name? Annie for um, Popeyes, right? There are these, those kind of images are like, it's almost synonymous, Blackness and fast food. So this is a complete inversion um, from what fast food began, you know, or how it began. So the question that really animated the project when I began was how, how did this ra racial patterning come, come to pass? And like, how did we go from this all American whiteness to oversaturated uh, black space? And so the book covers um, what I'm calling first end generation, second generation uh, fast food chains. And so those two generations opened in urban and suburban areas respectively. So the birth of the first generation uh, of fast food fell within what is termed the nadir of race relations in the US. So this is from the end of the Civil War to the 1930s. And so during this time, you know, you have Plessy versus Ferguson uh, ushering in legal segregation, lynchings were at their worst. Um, you know, the red summer of 1919 when uh, campaigns of racial terrorism uh, plagued the country, um, the destruction of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right, and many others. So this is a moment where um, many forces um, were undermining black life. And, and so this is the climate in which first generation fast food arose. So these are chains like White Castle, um, some of their knockoffs like White Tower, uh, Little Tavern in the DC area, Horn and Hard Art, um, not a knockoff, but that was another chain, uh, the, the Horn and Hard Arts Automats, which were in New York and Philly, um, Hot Shops, which was a drive-in in DC. So there are a lot of these different chains operating in different kinds of ways. Um, and, but the one thing they, none of them were franchised. So these are all corporate owned uh, outlets and they all were in urban areas. And so they were essentially like urban temples to whiteness because whether figuratively in who dined there or who worked there or literally in the architecture uh, design and even the name, right? Like White Castle. And so first generation fast food promised pristine and sanitary conditions at a time when food production had a prominent place um, in public discourse. And they also promised an unsullied kind of social whiteness in terms of what was the dining experience gonna be like if you, if you ate there. So catering to varied segments of uh, white, urban white populations, ranging from working class uh, white men uh, as pedestrians, either walking by restaurants or coming off uh, public transit to adults of different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, and then in some cases, motorists, uh, teens and adults. But the unifying characteristic was really uh, their whiteness. So then the second generation uh, of fast food began in the suburbs in the early 1950s. And so whereas the first generation was urban, early 1900s, it takes, a, you know, uh, depending on which restaurant you're taking, talk, talking about 20 to 50 years uh, before second generation comes along. So these are now the brand names that are currently most uh, synonymous with fast food, like McDonald's, Burger King, KFC. So these are all suburban outlets and they take fast food and, and, and this theme of purity and shift it in a key way. So that now it wasn't about the purity of just simple fuel for the working man, but really about the purity of white domestic space. And where first generation fast food uh, located on urban street corners, second generation chains were in uh, su suburbs on you know, large arterial uh, roads and so on. Although there were actually, some of, some of the chains did have a few urban locations, obviously in white neighborhoods as well. And then where the first generation was targeting uh, working adults, the second went after families, um, moms and children. So fast food then became more, you know, it was, it was more than food, it was, it was fun. So when you look back at the first generation and when it began, again, this is the early 1900s, food production, shopping, uh, consumption, all of those things were changing. They often presented significant challenges to urban residents. So, you know, the outdoor markets where white immigrants were shopping were really hectic. Um, um, you think about like New York City in, at this time and the tiny apartment people were living in. So they, they had scarce space in their residential, uh, in, in residences. Um, so that made it difficult to stock up on food. You might not have had sound cooking facilities. So eating out in a variety of establishments um, or at least buying some ready-made kinds of 
you know, uh, meals like from delis or bakeries and some small restaurants and so on, like the, that, that all became more popular. And so what emerged though, was that hygiene was an acute concern, um, both for eating out and for purchasing groceries, especially meat. So journalist Upton Sinclair uh, published a novel called The Jungle in 1906, based on the true horror of Chicago's uh, slaughterhouses and meat meatpacking industry. So his prose revealed, among many other ghastly things, you know, how the sausage was made, literally. So I'm going to read you a quote here from Sinclair. He says, quote, there would be meat that had tumbled out on the floor in the dirt and sawdust where, where the workers had tramped and spit uncounted billions of consumption germs, consumption meaning like uh, tuberculosis. There would be meat stored in great piles and rooms and the water from leaky roofs would rip over it and thousands of rats would race about on it. These rats were nuisances and the packers would put poisoned bread out for them. They would die and then rats, bread and meat would go to the hoppers together, end quote. So like the whole book, right, is just this, this you know, uh, one is one horrific sort of description of what was happening in the meatpacking industry after another. And so for the first generation chains to thrive, especially those selling burgers, they needed to overcome the concerns of uh, potential diners. So most of them made sanitary practices foundational uh, to their operations, whether that was implicitly or explicitly. So among the, the burger outlets, which I call the Burger Chateau because they had castle-like uh, designs and names. So the Burger Chateau, they brought whiteness front and center as part of this um, you know, thrust to uh, bring sanitary conditions um, uh, to front and center. And so they clad the buildings in whiteness as a testament to purity, which functioned both nutritionally and you know, food safety wise and racially. So White Castle was the progenitor of the, the Burger Chateau. It launched in 1921 uh, in Wichita, Kansas. And um, this was a time when the meat industry was engaged in aggressive PR campaigns, trying to portray its products as wholesome and healthy, right? They're still dealing with the uh, aftermath of uh, Sinclair's work. And so this is important because hamburgers at, at this time were really, you know, they weren't anything special. They were basically a meatball shoved between two pieces of white bread. Um, you know, you would eat them at like street fairs or, or county fairs and um, at roadside shacks that kind of had limited reach, you know, that, and so it was the kind of thing you just sort of eat that and take your chances, right? It's just street food. It, it was nothing special. So when J. Walter Anderson comes along um, and, and starts grilling them as flattened patties, he puts onions on top. It's like this new innovation um, for the white work, working class locals that were buying them. So he, um, Billy Ingram then joins with him and they form the chain White Castle. And in doing so, the, the restaurant with its shining white tile and architecture evoking royalty countered the kinds of concerns that were brewing around germs and unclean food um, and you know, make, made, made the idea of a burger something that was uh, reasonable to eat, safe to eat, good to eat. And then its locations in white space um, assuage concerns about uh, polluting bodies in the form of uh, black cons uh, consumers. And then, so then, you know, after White Castle, a bunch of different um, knockoff versions uh, come around. So White Tower um, is, it follows in 1926. This is uh, probably the biggest of the knockoff chains. It got itself actually into quite a protracted lawsuit uh, with White Castle for copyright infringement. But so they start in, uh, in Wisconsin and again, take up that same kind of motif of the purity of whiteness in its architecture um, and maintain a racial boundary that pervaded society elsewhere. So white Northerners, you know, were refusing to mix with black counterparts in social and especially leisure settings like amusement parks and especially swimming pools. And so, and they would routinely turn to violence uh, to maintain the color line. And so while, you know, of course the, you know, White Castle was not a, a, a leisure setting in the way that an amusement park or, or skating rink, but you know, you know, so they were, these were places, they were just pit stops, basically. You go there for your cheap, you know, inexpensive burger. Um, it, it's just, you know, a way to refuel and, and in very Spartan uh, kinds of uh, interiors. But again, very clean, everything shining, white tile, gleaming metal, et cetera. But it wasn't, it wasn't fun the way second generation uh, fast food would be. But even the, the pit stops uh, would not countenance uh, black customers. And then of course, it wasn't just the buildings that were clad in white, the staff were white men clad in white uniforms. Um, and the absence of black men is not surprising really given that the restaurants were nowhere near um, black neighborhoods. But it's also true that the labor practices um, 
that excluded black men were really carrying through this threat of the perceived uh, the perceived threat of contagion from from black bodies and and that precluded black workers taking up positions uh, behind the counter. So the Burger Chateau perpetuated racial hierarchies in the social order in that you know if you for example if you con contrast them with um, southern lunch counters where white women were the public face um, you know up, up at the counter and then black women were actually making the food back in the kitchen at the Burger Chateau there was no back so you couldn't do that so you 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 know the, the you couldn't have a black man standing as the representation of the business visible to everybody, especially even from the street, right? Because they have these big picture windows. So that, you know, that kind of um, very visible and um, visceral connection to, uh, to blackness was untenable in that, in that setting. And then another place where you see that extant ideas about race merging with concerns about food safety and hygiene and sort of seeping into restaurant operations is at uh, Horn and Hard Arts Automats. So again, these are this is a chain that was based in New York and Philly. They began really early, 1906 in Philly and 1912 in New York. And so this was for folks that don't know, it was a self-service format where you um, you know you'd go in and along the walls were these big uh, industrial kind of looking metal metal interfaces with lots of little glass cubicles. And so you would put your nickel in the slot and then open the little door to the, to the glass compartment and take out whichever food you want. And there were lots of different, there was a wide, wide variety of foods. And what was great from a sanitary perspective was that, oh, you could see your food before it was being made. You didn't have to worry about what kinds of horrific, you know, rat encrusted meats <laughs> you might be getting served, whatever. So that was, that was a key benefit for the consumer, but the chain restricted the positions that black people could hold there. So they were not in public facing positions. They were assigned, you know, to kitchen duties or to other places off screen, but um, they weren't. And, and so critically, they weren't allowed to put uh, the food in the com compartments lest the customer see a black hand touching the food and therefore uh, undo the idea of, of sanitary food. So then when the second generation was born, um, you know, by that point, you know, so this is the 1950s. We don't have all those concerns around hygiene in that way. Um, and second generation is really seeking out families and, con and, and constructing families to mean white suburban families. And so again, you know, black consumers were entirely inc incompatible there. And so black people were of course excluded from the suburbs where second generation was opening by federal and other policies. So they were physically uh, you know, separated from fast food but they were also symbolically excluded because the meals were offered as all American you know, uh, yeah, just part of this all American experience and black people did not have full access uh, to American citizenship. And so suburban fast food tried to construct itself as, as this white utopia, but almost immediately that notion was fraught and unstable because concerns quickly arose around teenagers um, who were money makers, right? Because they would come in number and they would spend a lot of money, but their rowdy behavior would put off adult diners. So they were hot rodding, goofing off in the parking lot and so on. And so it became this really difficult needle to thread of like, how do we attract this consumer segment that's foundational to the enterprise, but do so under conditions that are gonna keep them in line. And so this, this, this tension um, came up frequently in industry periodicals. You would see lots of you know, articles where um, people in the industry would you know, sort of just, you know, at, at wit's end, what do we do about the teenagers? Because the thing was like, they were an important part of the, um, of the whole concept. They were not just a source of revenue, but they're really the whole idea of second generation fast food. Like it's fun, family, wholesomeness. And so you couldn't have a restaurant concept that is founded on fun for the whole, whole family and then excise part of that family, right? So as neighborhoods were changing in the city <clears throat> and, and um, you know, racially and, and second generation chains were out in the suburbs, now they found themselves having difficulty um, persisting in the suburbs and trying to expand because communities became increasingly concerned about the, the disorder, um, you know, and sort of inappropriate behavior or whatever of, of these teens. And so, um, and so, but when you look back at the city where, you know, where, you know, white flight has left um, these neighborhoods to be changing over to black in areas where, particularly where there was, um, you know, that racial transition either wasn't complete or, was, you know, it was ongoing and, and, and tensions were high, the fast food restaurants that were there became flash flashpoints for racial violence. And so then, you know, the restaurants that 
had been coded as white, they were located in white space, they were um, represented as a benefit that accrued to whiteness. And so all of that took on additional symbolic weight for those who had not moved to the suburbs, right? Because this is something now they're, they, they're already finding their neighborhoods changing. And then now these, these outlets that are part of this new uh, exciting concept are also, um, you know, black people are beginning to access those as well. So what was at, at stake was not just an abstract kind of whiteness, but real social spaces and services that were that were becoming increasingly scarce as things fled to the uh, to the suburbs, and and the result was uh, was violence. So I'm going to read two short excerpts uh, that describe those kinds of incidents. Um, these are from Chicago uh, in 1967 and 1968. So one of them uh, is on the city's southwest side. So let's see. Okay, so at the White Castle at 79th and Pulaski in December of 1967, Floyd Joshua, a postal worker aged 18, was beaten directly in front of the store as he waited for a city bus. The location counted among its patrons a large number of students from the William J. Bogan High School and William J. Bogan Junior College across the street, as well as truckers, city workers, and white collar businessmen. The White, the white Castle had a reputation for warm, smiling service, which local media attributed to the company's code. This work ethic apparently did not extend to assisting individuals under attack by restaurant customers. As Joshua and another man waited for the bus, a pair of white males emerged from the restaurant and set upon them. Joshua did not see them until hot coffee had been splashed in his eyes and his head was struck by a blunt object. He lost consciousness and fell to the ground. And when he came to, his companion, his companion was, was under attack. Joshua was able to temporarily parry one of the assailants. And he explained that, quote, at that point, it appeared that other whites in the hamburger shop were going to come out and get into the fight. But just then the bus pulled up. Fortunately, the driver was a Negro. He jumped off the bus to help us and the white boys ran off." End quote. Joshua's mother was informed by another postal employee that this was not the first time racial violence had occurred in front of the fast food restaurant, for which, re for which reason Black people were discouraged from patronizing the outlet. So that's one. And then the second account is a year later. So again, this is still Chicago. So this is 1968. The Dunlap siblings, Veronica, age 20, and William, age 19, and their friend Leon Benford, 19, were Englewood residents who met with racist assault at a Burger King. They, along with Tyrone Thurkeald, 16, headed out on a late summer night to an area southwest of their homes in what was still very much a white stronghold. It was on the wrong side of Ashland Avenue, the defensive perimeter that se separated black from white. Between 1960 and 1970, whites had decamped from houses east of Ashland, leaving those to the west clinging desperately to the territory that remained. Bombings, fire, and vandalism awaited black residents who attempted to cross Englewood's impermeable racial boundaries. Burger King opened four blocks, of what, four blocks west of Ashland at 1814 West 87th Street between 1965 and 1967, one of only few, one of only few major commercial sites and the only restaurant. Situated on the same side of the street were several, several medical concerns, for example, a, a doctor's office, pharmacy, and clinical lab, and an electric company. Across the street were two liquor stores and a beauty salon. The outlet was the only place on that stretch where young white residents would hang out. And so in mid-August 1968, between 9.30 and 10 o'clock PM, when the four Englewood youths entered the Burger King hamburger stand, things turned bloody quickly. A mob of 20 to 25 white boys attacked the group with William Dunlap's sustaining the most visible injuries, a laceration on his forehead that required stitches. Veronica Dunlap and Leon Benford found a police officer and entreated him to help. He told Leon, quote, get your black blank out of here, is what the newspaper wrote. It was probably, blank was probably ass or something. Get your black blank out of here. You don't belong in this neighborhood anyway, end quote. Further, the officer drew his weapon and told Leon that, quote, if he did not leave, he'd shoot him, end quote. So these are just two of the incidents, um, and there were many of them, uh, a surprising number, which is not something I had really anticipated or thought about um, being an issue in this history, but, but came up to be uh, quite, quite prevalent. Um, and so these incidents really illustrate the closely guarded whiteness of fast food at the time, um, but that began to change, especially once neighborhood racial transitions were complete and white operators now held outlets in communities they never meant to serve. So one of the ways that fast food became dense in black neighborhoods is really just because they were sited there when the communities were white and 
um, when fast food carried symbolic meanings that made it a desirable amenity. And then they began to proliferate for many reasons once the neighborhoods uh, were black. In the late 1960s, black franchisees were brought on as the public face in these changing urban areas, uh, quote unquote, minority enterprise initiatives uh, from the federal government funded the, the growth of fast food with federal dollars because the government saw fast food and other franchises as a way to tamp down on unrest. So following the number, the, the numerous uh, uprisings that were taking place in the light, late 60s, they thought fast food would be a way to give, you know, you give black people franchises and, and maybe that will keep them happy. Um, meanwhile, you know, so while the federal government was making these kinds of new funds available, black franchisors were also creating their own black owned brands. So not, it wasn't just that black people were becoming franchisees of McDonald's, for example, but then there were, there were black celebrities who were creating their own franchise like Brady Keys, a, a former NFL player who created uh, all pro chicken. So, and, and for their part, they were doing so, you know, trying to serve black communities, right? From a perspective of uh, community empowerment. But so that was a new layer uh, of restaurants that began to open. And then in the 1970s came the advent of black targeted uh, advertising and an unabashed rush basically um, to claim what the industry saw as a quote unquote gold mine uh, in the ghetto. So whereas in the sixties, it was more about trying to appease social unrest and like using fast food as social policy by the seventies, it was just get the money and run. Um, and then in the, uh, the burger and chicken wars arrived in the 1980s, that further stimulated growth. And there were, you know, from there, there were just, I'm, and I'm skipping over other ones as well, but there were a lot of uh, factors that really uh, coalesced to continue to push uh, fast food to definitively take up space um, on the other side of the color line. So I'm gonna stop there. I think I'm out of time. How's my time doing? Yeah, I'm over time. And, um, and then we can talk more in the, the Q and A about other areas that I didn't discuss. Thank you for that insightful overview of your book. Uh, so now I want to uh, turn it over to our guest student respondents, Haley Christian, Nicholas Alano, Javisa Rodriguez, and Crystal Yu. But before we do that, I wanted to ask a question myself. So I'm curious, what inspired you to write a book about racial politics, about the racial politics of fast food restaurants and their impact on black communities? Yeah, it actually, thanks for that. It um, really just came out of what I had been doing um, in my research at the time. So I had published um, some research. We were looking at the uh, distribution of fast food restaurants across the five boroughs in New York. Um, this is 2008. And, you know, just so living in New York, it was just, it was and that's one thing I didn't talk about because I was focusing just now I was focusing on these on the major chains. But one thing you see in black neighborhoods is also a lot of the sort of small rickety chains like Crown Fried Chicken, Kansas Fried Chicken, you know, a lot of X Fried Chickens type of thing. And you would just see so much fast food that at street level, it appeared like, yeah, there's disproportionate amounts of fast food, but it's, it was an empirical question. So we sought to answer it. So we, we you know, mapped, we got all this data, mapped all the restaurants um, and found that it was yeah, percent black was the strongest predictor by far of fast food in the city. And it wasn't income, which is something that people often assume is really driving that relationship. It wasn't at all. So if you looked at, you know, first of all, like the line for the relationship between percent black and fast food was strong and positive. The line from income was basically flat. And if you compared, you know, high income black neighborhoods and low income black neighborhoods, they basically had the same exposure. So it wasn't income, income was not protective. And then if you looked at you know, um, high income black and high income white, the black neighborhoods were, you know, had high saturation and white neighborhoods didn't. Anyways, it was very clear that it was race. And so it was really just at that point that I thought, okay, so how did we get here? Because I knew, even though I hadn't really researched in great detail, I knew a little bit about fast food and that it was very white when it began. So it was just really wanting to understand how that, how that came to pass and what was the trajectory that, that moved it that way. Thank you. And uh, as I turn it over to our student responders, I want to ask that they start with one question. And then depending on how we're doing on time, we'll go back around and uh, provide an opportunity for you to ask more questions. So again, to start, I want to uh, ask Haley to 
come forth and ask a question. Haley? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my question for you is in your book, um, you discuss the vast contrasts of media depictions of teenagers and um, I guess their social lives and this marketing, it can be seen in the majority of media sources such as like Sprite, uh, McDonald's or athlete sponsorships. And this can sometimes be seen as um, pacifying since people may think, oh, it's good that there's more representation in commercials and other things. But um, how would you explain the role of capitalism and exploitation of marketing blackness? Thank you. Thanks for that question, Haley. Um, yeah, it's it's a tricky thing, you know, because a lot of the, you know, I mean, there's so marketing is not just advertising. And I think the point you just made about um, sponsorships is important because the ways in which blackness, I mean, fast food corporations, one thing they do is to sponsor a lot of black, you know, cultural events. Um, and this is something that, you know, came up in the book, but, and, and it's not just fast food, it's other corporations, um, tobacco, especially is notorious for that. If you look at, um, uh, Keith Whalu's new book, um, uh, pushing cool. And I don't remember the full subtitle, but it's about uh, menthol cigarettes and how big tobacco uh, came to target black uh, consumers. It's the same kind of thing is like those corporations want to not just it's not just that they want to um, get more consumers and more, you know, more people in the store buying Big Macs. Yes. But you also want to sort of give the corporation a halo of positivity, one that's seen as being, um, yeah, not just, re uh, rep you know, not just having representation, but really being having a, 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 an ethos that's committed to the, you know, the benefit of black communities um, in multiple ways. And so they use a number of strategies and, and one of them that's critical for that is, um, is sponsorship. And so um, I think the way that, the, the way that um, fast food has related to blackness over time, like I say, it's changed, but it always, it was always in a way that served the industry um, and, and the consumers it thought were that were the most important for it at that time. So at the beginning, that meant excluding black patrons altogether and preserving this veneer of whiteness. Later, it was really more about, well, now we have black customers just because the neighborhoods have changed due to white flight. So we might as well serve the black customers that are there. And then it became actually, while we're at it, why not try to extract as much money as possible? And it was only then that you start to see um, the development of black focused um, advertising, which, yeah, like you say, could have this impression of, oh, they really trying to have more representation and include, you know, black people in their, you know, and black people should be able to see themselves and so on. But it's really only because at that point, they've decided they want to extract as much money as possible. Thank you, Nick. Hi, hello, Dr. Kwase. I loved your uh, breakdown of the book and um, it's very interesting. Uh, and one of the things I was wondering about was that you touched on um, this connection between fast food and uh, racial uh, violence. And a lot of this, uh, as we know, happened um, you know, in the 50s and 60s. And we talk about things like segregation. And um, I was wondering if there was any um, modern day uh, examples of uh, this kind of thing happening where we see a connection between um, racial disparity, whether it's violence or otherwise, um, and that how that's connected to uh, fast food. Thanks, Nick, that's a great question. I, I can't say that I've seen any, I mean, I don't think I saw any reports other than the ones that I described, which were like, yeah, they were in the 60s. There didn't seem to be much um, after that. And even the ones that I did see, clearly that's some subset of an unknown number because you know, not all of them are obviously going to be reported. Those that are reported are not going to necessarily be reported in the news and so on. And, and so, and most of the ones that I saw were reported in the black press, not in, actually they might've all been in the black press. Um, you know, the, the, like, for example, the ones in Chicago, the Chicago Tribune wasn't reporting on that. Um, I did see some in industry periodicals. So the, the, um, the paper nation's restaurant news had reported on, um, some incidents taking place in New Jersey, but so, it's hard to really get a sense of, you know, the scope of it. 
but it clearly was happening more, you know, it, it was clearly not an isolated uh, uh, scenario. And it wasn't just in a particular locale. It was in Chicago, it was in New Jersey, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was in DC, it was different places. So, um, but I don't think I've seen any post 60s. And I think, you know, again, but if, if there, I mean, there, there probably are incidents of hate crimes that happen at fast food in the more contemporary moment, but I would hazard that they wouldn't have, they wouldn't be from the same motivational standpoint in as much as the restaurants at that time, you know, the symbolic meanings of fast food at that time of, of, of this, you know, utopia and this, this, this kind of happy new experience that white people were trying to hoard for themselves at that time, you know, it wouldn't have that same valence today. So whatever, if, if there was violence occurring, I don't think it would be quite in the same, in the same vein. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And before we go on to Juvia, I also wanted to mention that we will be opening up the floor for audience questions uh, after this round of uh, student responders. So if you have a question, uh, you can go ahead and put it in the chat now, or you can wait a bit, hear what some others have to say and uh, submit it later. Okay, Juby. Thanks so much for the great discussion so far. So in chapter five of your book, uh, you discuss the shift that occurred in the fast food landscape during the 1960s. So like the move from the suburban to urban areas. And um, although there were some, there was some resistance by community members at the time, as you described, um, it's clear that the resistance was in fact racist sentiment. So there were, you know, you talk in the, in, in chapter five about um, the fear of making a community, you know, ghetto, if you will. Um, and so I was wondering if you could expand on how this resistance contributed to white flight um, and also fuel disinvestment in these communities. Wow. Uh, thank you. Um, so, so first of all, okay. So the resistance that, yeah, I talked about in, at that point in the book. So um, obviously for audience members who haven't um, gotten a sneak preview of that chapter, there, there a few things were happening. So like the, the, the racial violence I just described, you know, was indicative of the kinds of ways in which white neighborhoods, some white neighborhoods, at least some white urban residents felt that white fast food was still white. We want this for ourselves. We're willing to defend this with violence. On the other hand, you, you had um, suburban communities um, where fast food was becoming disorderly. It, you know, fast food was basically overstaying its welcome. You know, it was cre cre creating all of these issues with the teenagers hot rotting and so on. And so fast food as an industry started to look back towards the city that it had avoided in the first place other than first generation fast food. And because as the suburbs became more volatile, ordinances started to get passed around, well, you can't, either you can't, in the extreme, you can't open a fast food restaurant here at all, but otherwise we're restricting the hours and they were putting up lots of different kinds of roadblocks that made the industry concerned. And then, the, so they started looking back to the city because the city was gonna be actually easier to open um, and expand in you know, compared to what was happening now in the suburbs. But for the residents who were resisting fast food's entree, you know, the racism in the, in the, in the, in the one case where um, people were talking about fast food would make it a ghetto, they, you know, at, at that point, so this is in Philly, in uh, Philly's Fern Rock neighborhood, those residents were actually mostly black at that point. So their concern wasn't from, you know, trying to keep out black people because the neighborhood was black and many of them were, but it was really more that what is, what is the industry doing that, you know, they are trying to move, the, the residents were expressing that they had tried to move into, you know, a, a more, um, a, uh, an income, a, a greater, an area with a greater income and a more, even though it's still within the city limits, but a different, a more suburban kind of feel to the neighborhood. And so their concern was, well, now, the in, now that we're here, the industry wants to come in here. And that, the in, you know, they were trying to bring this disorderly problematic kind of food restaurant um, or food food outlet to the neighborhood, which we feel like is only going to contribute more problems. So you see, when you see the kinds of um, contestations around fast food, it's a lot of the same things. There's going to be more litter. There's going to be more noise. There's going to be problems with traffic and parking. It's just you know, it's problems. So their their perspective was this industry is not interested in our concerns about trying to keep this community in you know x kind of x y z kind of way. 
and they're really just motivated by whatever it is that they want to do. But you see the you see those kind of things come up again and again. Um, for example, in New York on the Upper East Side, McDonald's tried to open, um, and there they they made a mistake because you know they weren't really considering this is a neighborhood with a lot of power and influence, and they and their attempt to open an, uh, a restaurant there was met with with stuff they weren't prepared for. It, that doesn't happen in communities that have that less clout. So the, the, you know, the, the tenor of the resistance changed depending on what neighborhood it was and then with what kind of impact. But I wouldn't say it necessarily fueled white flight because you know, by the time the restaurants were coming into those neighborhoods, the, the white flight had already mostly been complete. You know what I mean? So um, if anything, it was more like, yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a marker of, of that transition having happened rather than causing it to happen. Thank you. Crystal? Hi, Dr. Quaid. Thank you so much for um, sharing with us about your upcoming book. It was very, very interesting for sure. Um, so I was a little curious about I know you didn't specifically mention, but um, I saw chapter nine is titled Black Franchisers and Black Economic Power. So I was wondering if you could speak more about that, maybe um, what affects Black franchisers getting involved in fast food? Like, what did it have, what effect did it have on them as individuals and maybe on the Black community as a whole, whether socially or economically? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, yeah, the Black franchisers, they're an interesting group because so. You know, as I mentioned briefly, they were mostly celebrities. Um, you know, in some cases, more just as figureheads, um, and others who were more intimately involved in actually trying to run the restaurant. So Brady Keys is probably the one that's the most who had who had the most um, uh, he had the biggest empire, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, but so Brady Keys, he played in the NFL. And then he started All Pro Chicken. And his goal was, even though he wanted to, um, you know, he, so he wanted to start this chain of chicken restaurants so that he would be able to give franchisee, franchisees or make black franchisees part of the, of the company, right? So that, because most of the big chains, so McDonald's, for example, didn't get its black, first black franchisee until 1968. So this is Herman Petty in Chicago. Um, Burger King's, uh, first franchisee was Willie Taylor in what year was that? I forget exactly, but in the 1970s. So they were late, you know, like these chains had been in operation for more than a decade at least. Um, and black franchisees didn't have access to that. So the black franchisors were coming along and saying, well, if the, if the existing major industry is not gonna do it, we're gonna do it. And the goal was we're gonna try to build wealth, obviously both for the one per the person developing the concept and all the shareholders and so on, but also for the fr black franchisees that we're going to give um, access to, and then also for the for the black crew members that they envision working uh, in the stores, so they you know they really try to envision like a multiple tiered thing. But at the end of the day, I mean, it wasn't you know the, the benefits, and this is something that you see throughout the book is that those benefits really mostly accrued to the elites. It wasn't like fast food likes to have a story in America that it's for you know the average person who can start a franchise and or open a franchise and be an operator and just you know create untold riches but that doesn't it doesn't really happen because it requires a lot of capital investment even as a franchisee just to to operate the store and so for the most part that doesn't really pan out and then for the fr franchisors they too you know they face the same kind of discrimination that the franchisees did in many ways like if they're trying to deal with the federal government or trying to get f loans from private entities or whatever it is they're trying to do, they were also facing a lot of discrimination. So they, they, you know, they weren't necessarily able to create the, um, this, this, this opportunity for community empowerment or for economic development that they thought it would be. And then again, many of them already are coming from a position of wealth anyway, like Brady Keys was not, you know, um, an average person off the street. He was coming from the NFL. And so, the industry was really more interested in either having somebody like him act as like a cultural broker, you know, to work to, to sort of be as a go-between uh, to communities that they didn't understand um, and help them make money. But for the most part, that yeah, the franchise, the black franchisors was was 
that's kind of a dream deferred. That, do, that doesn't really pan out in the end. Thank you. And I'm wondering, sticking with the uh, issues of uh, Black franchisees for a moment, I'm wondering if you uh, looked at the phenomenon of Black franchisees primarily being offered opportunities in Black neighborhoods and not being allowed to buy franchises in you know, wealthier suburban, often white neighborhoods, in effect, having this sort of uh, economic inequality in terms of the amount of money that the franchise owners can make? Yes, that is something that, it, it's funny because there was just um, a lawsuit, was it 2020 or? 2021, anyway, but there was just a, a new McDonald's black franchisee lawsuit um, against corporate that they were being shut out from different kinds of opportunities for just what you're describing like. And, and that was a refrain that really from since the beginning, since they got in until now, it's clearly not gotten any better, but there was persistently redlining in terms of where black franchisees were able to get outlets. So they would, they, you know, they would literally, they would have, um, you know, the people who were doing the franchising would tell prospective black franchisees like, well, you can't have this location, like that's for a white person. And so like they would be restricted from where they could have outlets, the, the, you know, they were given less profitable stores, they were given stores with more problems, they were given, given less support uh, from corporate the, and, and the kinds of things that were supposed to help them to make them be successful. And that is just a long refrain, like really, yeah, from the 60s till now that apparently continues. Thank you. And I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions from the students before we jump into audience questions. So Haley, I'm going to go back to you. Okay. Um, so I guess being in, being immersed in this topic and this content, um, have you thought of solutions that could mitigate the negative relationship with fast food restaurants and the Black community? And also, um, if you've spoken with any community members or people in affected neighborhoods, and if they have shared their thoughts on this. Thank you. That, yeah, that is the one thing I didn't really uh, do. I, you know, there wasn't any ethnographic research as, as part of the methods for this project. Um, and so, the, you know, much of what I know about how communities have responded has been through existing, you know, ar archival material and so on. Um, and so I think the question is really, it depends how you are framing that what the negative impact of, of fast food. So, you know, in terms of how you're gonna redress it because it's a bigger issue than just the food. I mean, you know, fast food um, certainly, like I said, has nut nutritional liabilities that contribute to chronic disease and that perpetuate the kinds of um, health inequities we see, but it's bigger than that as well. Like, um, so as Ella Baker said, right, it's bigger than a burger, but it's, it's really, and so for example, in South Los Angeles, they enacted a fast food ban um, where what they were doing was, and so this is for the, what used to be called South Central is now South, South LA. And this was an area that um, had, you know, very high saturation of fast food and also a dearth of other kinds of retail that they wanted. And so they banned, they enacted legislation to ban the entree of new outlets with the hope that that would, you know, A, stop the proliferation any further, and then B, um, pot potentially allow for the influx of new kinds of retail. And what they, what happened was, you know, so th then there, there have been public health studies that have looked at this afterwards to see what have been the health effects, whether the, the uh, food landscape has changed. And it didn't that much. And that's, you know, in part, which is what some of the organizing, you know, the folks who were doing the organizing noted is that because redlining still exists, like it's still a black neighborhood, black and Latinx, like it, it, just because you, you've prevented an additional fast food doesn't mean all these other restaurants or other kinds of retail are gonna suddenly now pour in, like they could have been there if they wanted to. And we saw, you know, we did a study in New York where we looked at um, retail redlining in the city where we looked at access to different kinds of retail within, you know, like how far do you have to travel to get to a host of different retail? So anything, bookstores, apparel, 
pharmacies, what else do we look at? Office supplies, did I say that already? Just different kinds of things. And because the idea is often, the, it's often the case that people assume, well, if there's all this fast food in this, rush, in this neighborhood, it must be because the demand is really high and black people just must eat lots of, of fast food. And that's why the restaurant is there. They just going where the people want it. As if, first of all, retail ever does what black people want, but in any case. So we looked at whether, if that's true, if it's really demand, right, then there shouldn't be a relationship between the percentage of black, res, uh, black residents and whatever the distance to the nearest outlet is after you, after you control for demand, right? So we looked at meet, um, percent black, median household income, uh, population density, what else did we look at? I think it was like uh, nearby subway stations and then retail demand. And the retail demand marker is, uh, is the, was the market potential index, which is a, a commonly used industry measure. And that measure in itself already underestimates demand. But, and so when you look at that, black neighborhoods, basically for every type of retail, for the most part, black res New Yorkers would have to travel farther to get to any of those types after you control for all that, it wasn't demand. Like there's still a relationship between percent black. They would have to travel farther than for example, white counterparts would have to. Um, fast food was one instance where you didn't have to travel farther, it was actually closer. You know what I mean? Like there was, it was inversely related. So, but but again, that's after controlling for the demand. It's not, it's not about the demand. So if that, if, if you know, trying to use those kinds of solutions, not that I'm, knocking the folks in LA because that was, I, I think it was really important that they were doing this self-determined kind of, you know, organizing to try to uh, affect the change in their community. But the point is that, yeah, it's not by itself going to eliminate all the other barriers that, that are already in place. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's I think it's, I think it's tricky. I don't think there's one solution, but it requires clearly like multiple fronts on how you, how are you going to address that? Hey, thank you. So um, we do have a question from the audience and it states, are you aware of any efforts to get legislation passed related to racial justice and fast food as it relates to the farm bill? And this is from Lauren Tweedale. Thank you, Lauren. I don't, not that I know of, not, I've not seen it connected to the farm bill, but like I say, there. I don't, I mean, and there's not a lot of legislation um, specifically uh, oriented around trying to um, promote racial justice for fast food. Like there, mostly you don't, you don't see that from a perspective of legislation that the South LA ban is one of those uh, few exceptions. But also it's worth noting too, because what was interesting about the South LA case, case was that, you know, their perspective was was like I say, from a community justice perspective, but you see other neighborhoods or other communities like Calistoga um, and in California, and then there's um, Port Jefferson in, in Long Island. There are other areas where people where people have gotten together and um, enacted ordinances for that for that community to ban fast food, but it's but it's been from a perspective of like either it's aesthetics or you know it's going to affect the character of the community or something. And those are all seen as legitimate. legitimate. But when South LA enacted their ban around health and the other concerns, and it, wasn't, and it wasn't also importantly in South LA, it wasn't just the fact that the restaurants serve food that are linked to chronic disease. It was, it was more than that. It was like also even the landscaping that you, know, you have all of these impermeable surfaces of parking lots. So they also, in, in addition to forbidding new restaurants, they forbid, forbade, um, uh, you know, uh, enacting new drive-throughs uh, and so on. So like they were interested in the car emissions, the parking lot, the heat, the heat islands they're creating. Like there were, there was a multiple, there were multiple concerns, but, um, but yeah, but they, the, the South LA um, organizers got a lot of flack for doing that. And, um, and you don't see that when in, in other cases where it's in, in white communities where it's seen as legitimate to try to preserve the character of that, of that space. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from my friend Dennis Derrick. He says, thanks for reminding me of Horn and Hardwick, where I worked as a dishwasher at age 16 when freshman in college. No one, one thinks of wealth creation when you think of franchises. Can you explain the business structure of why that is not so? For example, McDonald's is not in the hamburger business, but in the land 
insurance and supplies business. Yes, thank you for that. That's amazing that you worked at Horn and Hardart. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so what's his name? Harry Sonnenborn was the financial wizard uh, from McDonald's who, uh, who, who was fond of saying that McDonald's was not uh, a restaurant. It was, it, was a, it was a real estate business that happened to sell hamburgers. And so, and his reasoning was that, you know, they, the, the way the business was structured so that they would find these sites that where they wanted to, you know, to open and like, they were, they were really focused on land acquisition or, you know, to, where, where the new outlets would be built. And like, really the whole franchise model relies on basically all the input is coming from the, from the franchisee. You know what I mean? So like they have to, they would have to put down a deposit. They have to front, you know, large numbers, you know, a large amount of money to, to get the, the outlet built. Um, they have to pay royalties, you know, like basically corporate pays very little in terms of how, how the, the capital investment required to open a new outlet. And then everything else, once it's running is on the franchisee. You know what I mean, like, so they ha obviously have to manage all of the purchasing and, and the, uh, staffing and all of that. And then again, they're paying royalties. They have to pay for advertising co-op and so on. So it, it, it kind of, it's like, it has this, that's why that, that whole model didn't work. And like part of, part of the idea when um, the federal government was creating all of these different kinds of uh, minority enterprise programs as they call them. And, you know, this idea was like, well, we'll, we'll create this black capitalist kind of uh, model and, and where folks will be able to get in and have like their own version. But really, I mean, the, which of course does not address that capitalism is not gonna work as a structure anyway, but this, but this model of franchising it's not, you know, the operator doesn't have much of anything for themselves. And so they're, they're sort of locked into this system that where they take on all the risk, basically. And so what you saw a lot of the times was that people would come in and like they would go into debt, you know, they would have lots of debt um, that was hard to repay there. And then there were also predatory schemes. There was a, um, a whole thing where uh, there were what were called zebra partnerships where um, white investors would come in and partner with uh, a black operator. And Herman Petty, the first uh, black franchisee for McDonald's got sort of roped into, into one of these where, and so the white investors were really, you know, um, they're supposed to be partners, but they were basically, it was, it was basically a predatory system because like they were charging Petty management fees. Like how do you manage, you know, how does he have to pay to manage his own restaurant essentially? I mean, so like, and they were, they just, they were, it was all very extractive. So I think that's what's fundamentally the, the issue around um, franchising is that it, it just, the franchisee takes on all the risk. They have to put out the most uh, output in terms of capital outlays. And then they, it's hard to, to take in enough to, um, to get rich. Plenty do. There are, you know, it's not to say that there are no black uh, franchisees who haven't made a lot of money. There are, but I think it's, 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 it's proposed as this sort of um, risk-free kind of thing where you don't have to, they, you know, oftentimes they would talk about, you don't have to have any training. You don't have to know anything. Corporate will help you. They'll give you all the training. You have the name brand to work with, you know, and like, in fact, none of that is really true. And so for the most part, it, it, it didn't, uh, it didn't pan out for those who went into it. Our next question is from uh, Nick Freudenberg, who is the, uh, uh, founding director of our institute and a senior faculty fellow. He says, thank you so much for your book talk. It seems like several different groups are fighting the fast food industry, workers who are paid too little and asked to work too much, parents and communities concerned with the growing burdens of diabetes and other diet related diseases and economic development groups looking for more sustainable approaches to growth that keep more wealth in, in the community to name a few. Have you seen or can you envision bringing these groups together to advance a common agenda that focuses on the role of the industry in perpetuating racism, inequality, and ill health? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, because so I, I will say the labor perspective and the workers is not, that's one I don't really address in the book. Um, and I think that's one that's been in the most um, that's been most brought into sharp relief in, in um, recent years is, you know, what has been the conditions for workers 
Um, and that's not really something I deal with in the book, but I think, yeah, there, there are, I mean, I think there are points of convergence where that would make sense, where if people are working from, even though they're working from different perspectives and, you know, each constituency has a, a, a specific aim that they're, um, that they're coming from, I think the points of convergence, um, around equity and around, you know, um, really trying to, um, envision something beyond the strictures of what the franchise model how that normally operates. I mean, I think that's possible. I don't know how likely it is. I mean, I think it also, the industry, you know, is itself not especially, it, it's lost a lot of the sheen that it once had. Um, and I think it's for that reason, um, a little more, I don't know if it's even possible, but potentially more ruthless than it once was. Um, and sort of more willing to double down on whatever policies it has to whatever uh, impact on on the people that engage with it, whether you know whether it's their workers or whoever, whoever else. So it would be challenging, but um, but possible. But I, it's hard. It's hard to. I don't. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure how likely that would be. It's possible, but I'm. Yeah, not I, sure. mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm reminded of in the '90s. Uh, there was a commercial called Calvin Got a Job, and it was a McDonald's commercial. Uh, where that really puts this idea of a fast food job as respectability politics. You know, he's walking through the hood. Even one of the characters says, hey, welcome to the, welcome back to the hood. And everyone's just like, he's really on his way up. He's got a job. At me. I mean, but you never see what the job is. You just kind of see him walking through the hood and everyone's sort of looking at him differently, a different, you know, pep in his step. And then at the end, you see him put on a McDonald's uniform. And again, connecting this notion of, of respectability and mobility to McDonald's. But that's all out the window. You know, we don't see that at all anymore when it comes to uh, fast food jobs, particularly fast food jobs in black neighborhoods. And one of the things I teach food policy at the School of Public Health and in the um, lecture where we talk about food workers, I ask my students, when is the last time you've gone to a fast food restaurant and the person working there hasn't been black? And mm. almost no one can ever remember that. And the fact that we've just internalized the fact that black people do these jobs and it's unquestioned even though we're only 12% of the population, we're, you know, anecdotally, at least almost 80 to 90% of the people who work in these jobs. And it's just seen as a given in any other setting with any other group, that would be really unusual. People would think what's going on here, but that, those questions are, are rarely asked when it comes to black people. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. It's from Danielle Countryman. Would you consider your book to be an exploration of commercial determinants of health Given the, de given the deliberate manipulation and enabling of racist slash classist consumerism and how would and how could commercial activities be held to account for these outcomes? I mean, thank you. Honestly, um, I don't know if I would characterize the book that way in as much as it's not really, I mean, for me, it was the, you know, the health, I, I was coming from a perspective where I had been writing and doing research in um, health consequences or health determinants of health, but the book itself doesn't really look so much at health. I mean, like, towards the end, I talk more about it because uh, in, in the 2000s where, you know, this is when there's a lot more concern around food environments and it, that's, that's, you know, literature starts to build up. Um, but it's not, the book is itself is not really looking at how did this, how did this shift um, affect, affect health outcomes. So I don't know if I would um, describe it quite that way, but I do think it's uh, useful as sort of deep background, you know, in, in terms of like, how do we think about the determinants of the determinants as it were. So, you know, if, if fast food is a determinant for the different kinds of chronic disease or other kinds of things that we're concerned about, okay, well, what was this trajectory that brought it here to, to begin with? And, and, you know, how should we think about that? Um, so yeah, that's how, that's how I would describe it. Next question is from Tom McElherney. Sorry if I butchered your name, Tom. Uh, in the documentary film, El Susto, filmmaker Karen Atkins describes how diminishing demand for Coca-Cola in the US caused new marketing by Coke in Mexico and elsewhere in the world. Do you see parallels between her film and your book? Thanks. Interesting question. Um, so, the, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't get into fast food internationally really, which 
and there was a Times article too, so like I don't remember what year it was, but some in some like I say in the past, maybe since 2018 or 17 or something like that, but where they were looking at fast food in in West Africa, I want to say it was in Ghana. Um, but and so you do see even I, I've not researched this, so I don't know, you know, what 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 the um, you know, granularly what that what that actually looks like. But I do know that fast food has been moving more to markets where they haven't been in the past, especially as they're as that consumption is beginning to recede here. And um, I know also that they was it was it McDonald's, no, McDonald's or KFC? One of them um, opened in Jamaica, and then just was it was unsuccessful. They ended up closing it, which I thought was amazing. I tried to find out more about that, and there was really nothing to be seen. But yeah, so they in. They don't always succeed uh, everywhere they go. But also what was interesting was that in the earlier history, like they, fast food was more willing, like they started opening outlets abroad in Europe, for example, before they were coming to black communities. Like they thought it was, it was a better market to go overseas um, than to serve their uh, customers, their neighbors uh, right nearby that were black. So, you know, they came, they came to black neighborhoods late after, um, after having her, um, already having traveled abroad, so. Yeah, for what that's worth. The next question is from Elizabeth Henderson. What you describe about fast food franchises sounds a lot like chicken farmers. Could you comment on how this relates to the absence of healthy food outlets? To chicken farmers? Yes, I think uh, what Elizabeth is referring to, there is a the system in, under which independent farmers contract with Tyson and other large chicken uh, chicken producers or chicken distributors is very much a franchise model. They're forced to pay, pay for, you know, modifying their, their, their housing, modifying the, the way in which the chickens are, are reared, et cetera, and all the burden is put on them. And ultimately these large scale uh, chicken distributors, chicken, they would call themselves producers, are constantly putting price pressures on these contractors in order to lower the cost of ch chicken while reaping, you know, historic prof profits. So I think Elizabeth is saying there's a parallel between what these independent contractors have experienced with the chicken manufacturers and the franchisees for fast food. And in particular, there's been a number of different stories, and I believe there's a lawsuit and possibly pending legislation to address some of the issues that Black chicken producers, which are... Uh, woefully few, I think it was something like, you know, five to eight of them, uh, some of the things they've been experiencing in terms of inequalities and racism within this overall structure. So I think, again, that's the comparison, I, I think. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this, I guess you answered it. I don't, I mean, I, I don't know from chicken farmers, I can't really speak to that. But um, yeah, I mean, I've, I think that's, it sounds like that's basically uh, that's the parallel is that again the risk the, the franchisee takes on the risk and um you know um if the if the business goes under you know the, the fast fast food corporate just puts in another person and that's actually something you'd see quite frequently that there was a there was a lawsuit um in uh from a um an operator who was previously in texas and then moved to baltimore and then uh, and and he identified as Hispanic. Um, Sanchez was his last name, and he um, he went into this outlet in Baltimore, where um, you know previous franchisees had been at that same location, and then corporate and the, the the location wasn't successful. It had lots of issues, and then corporate didn't support the franchisee, and basically they would re, they would just keep recycling people, so they would come in and fail, and and um, and you know and they were in, and in the lawsuit. It was alleged that they were engaged in these discriminatory processes again, like where they were redlining them, and, and you know Sanchez wasn't allowed to open here or there. He was only given this location and so on. And there was a lot of you know alleged deceit um, in terms of the the kinds of things that were promised and then fell through and so on. So, you know, when you're in that kind of situation again, that franchisee doesn't have. I mean, it's not your own business. It's not your own. You you don't have a choice. It's not that you're starting your own restaurant that you want to serve X neighborhood, and so you're going to open. At this particular place where you've done the diagnostics and think this is a good um, site for the community I'm trying to to reach and so on, you're basically at the whim of what corporate um, decides. And so again, if it goes south, you know that's going to be on you. 
The next question is from Phillips Health Ministry, and this is sort of a long one, so uh, I'll try to highlight the main points. We are here in Hartford, Connecticut, specifically north of Hartford and dealing with food deserts and food swamps. Do you think there is a system, systematic disinvestment to drive people to fast food outlets instead of nurturing healthy lifestyles and growing slash purchasing slash preparing fresh fruits and vegetables? We have a life expectancy gap of 15 to 20 years shorter than our neighboring suburbs just three miles away. Supposedly, grocery retailers don't see our area as attractive. Profits over the well-being of people. Interested to know your thoughts. I mean, thank you. I, I, um, I don't know if I would say purposeful in the sense of, if I heard that correctly, like purposeful as in, well, we, we will, I'm sorry, could you read that beginning part again? The disinvestment of what they said about? Uh, at the, at the, sort of at the beginning. Do you, like do you the think there's been a systemic disinvestment to drive people to fast food outlets instead of nurturing healthy lifestyles? Okay. Right. Like, I don't, I don't know if um, I would say the disinvestment is meant to, is meant to, um, you know, uh, push people to fast food as opposed to something else. I, I mean, it's like fast food um, can operate better in the context of disinvestment because the rent is cheaper. There's more land available. Like if you think about you know, most uh, like where, where if Burger King wants to erect a new restaurant, where is that going to happen? I mean, not take over like an empty storefront, but like actually create a new building, um, especially since they, they especially like street corners. Like, where are you going to do that? That in, 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 especially in an affluent neighborhood, a white neighborhood, you, there's th that space, there's no vacant lot sitting around. For, the, for them to erect a new restaurant like that. Like, so uh, I'm currently in Chicago, uh, which is my hometown. And um, the, on the South side, the amount, the, the city actually just issued something where they're allowing people to, where, where they're like selling vacant lots that the city owns. And so people who own a home, you can buy the lot next to you for, you know, very, very cheap price. Or, and then there are other just lot, regular lots that people can just buy. But the amount, when you see the map of where the lots are, the amount of the amount of vacant space, and you see it if you drive through the south side. It's astonishing. Like it doesn't make any sense. How much land just sitting empty? It doesn't make any sense. And so you know, but, but that kind of thing. Like if you want to open a new restaurant on a street corner, well, then that means it has to be in a in a community where the disinvestment is insane, so that there's even available space to do that. And so you know. Um, and then if not, you know, yeah, the rent is going to be cheaper if it's in built built up space. You have, you know, the, the unemployment is going to be higher, so you have more people who uh, can, can serve as uh, available uh, staff and so on. So I, I just, I think it's really more that the disinvestment creates the conditions for for fast food to thrive. That I don't think they have to try <laughs> uh, purposely. Yeah. I'm also wondering if you think that um, cooperative models are a way forward for uh, black entrepreneurs in terms of not only being treated equally, but also in terms of the having some control over the quality and the uh, nutritious value of food. You know, we've seen historically black co-ops, particularly I'm thinking of uh, one of the ones in Harlem uh, that really show what's possible. But so much of that has been tossed by the wayside in favor for us, a sort of race to the bottom. Um, so I'm wondering what you think in terms of the future. Are we simply locked into this and, you know, there's there's no way out because it's a broader issue or do you see any glimmers of hope? No, I do. I do think so. I think, and I think co-ops are um, really an important, um, you know, uh, pathway for that. Actually, my colleague, um, Stacy Sutton at University of Illinois, Chicago is doing a lot on co-ops, um, both research-wise and, and in, uh, in the city. And so she could speak um, better to co-ops than I can, but I, it's something that did come up early in, you know, the earlier sort of, well, midway through the, through, through the timeline. 
where, like you said, I mean, it was really too bad because there was a lot of movement around black co-ops at the time. And you could see that they were developing them. Um, uh, There's one that was uh, created by Elko Out Guild uh, Gardens, a uh, housing project in the south, far south side of, of Chicago, uh, organizing around trying to, you know, address that the um, insufficient access to the kinds of foods that they needed and so on. But like that all sort of, um, yeah, fell aside as many um, actors pushed this model of black capitalism um, that really never had the the possibility of a liberatory kind of um, outcome that that um, those communities would want. So yeah, to me, I do think co-ops and, and others of those kinds of models that are aside from trying to fit into a, a capitalist framework that's just not, it's just not, it doesn't have the potential to, um, to bring the community the kinds of uh, resources it really needs, so. Uh before we wrap up here, I want to offer the opportunity for uh, one of our student responders to ask one more question. So I'm gonna just randomly pick one. Crystal, I'm gonna go to you. I had a question that I was quite curious about actually. So this is cool. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Quit, you mentioned um, federal financing of fast food in the ghetto. And I think before there was a question where you talked a little bit about, I forget what it was, but it was something about the government, which re reminded me of this. Um, so I guess like what role did the government play in the fast food industry's kind of invasion into black American uh, neighborhoods? Great question, thanks. They, um, so first I also wanna point out uh, Chin Ju's book, which she published 2017 or 16, one of them. Um, and it's called Supersizing Urban, Urban America. And I don't remember the subtitle, but it's something about like, how how the government you know fueled fast food um and yeah and so then I, I have a chapter in the book that looks at this well so basically they um they uh created a number of initiatives uh loans through the uh, small business administration um a, a bunch of individual kinds of little programs 25 by times two times two, Mesbix, there were, there were different programs, but all of them were designed to increase um, black, black business, the participation in black, in black business. And, um, and so what they did was it was like, if you, because, um, so first of all, they're working from, again, from the perspective of black capitalism. And so what they were trying to do was so-called create more opportunities for black entrepreneurs to have business. And so in their framework, they thought, okay, well, the, the best way to do that is through franchising because black people don't necessarily, in their mind, don't necessarily have the, the background, the management skills, the, the knowledge, whatever. Um, it, in a franchising model, you already have this established entity that's you know, with, with, with name recognition the, and you have um, the opportunity where the entrepreneur is going to have the training from corporate, like they're not just on their own creating their new own restaurant and having to figure out how do you run a kitchen, how do you whatever, and you have all of this stuff. And so they made franchising really the model of trying to um, redress the fact that, you know, what, what Black people were uprising against in the late 60s and, and trying to make this like, well, there's all this unrest, the way to do that is to give them businesses or to, to, to tamp that down is to give them businesses. The way to give them businesses is to give them franchises. And so, fra and so fast food became really the model for that. So that, you know, so that, so that's why you end up with fast food, you know, so, sort of blowing up at that time because the government is pouring in money to make those kinds of uh, opportunities available. And then you also even see too, like there would be white entrepreneurs who were trying to get in on the gravy train and they would like partner with somebody black in some, you know, to whatever tangential degree, but so that they would all, so that their business could receive minority funding and so on. But there was, a, so there was just a lot, there was just a lot of federal money, what, you know, most of which was loans um, to, to, you know, that were devoted to creating, uh, uh, creating franchises. And again, fast food was the most popular of them. There were others, like there were car dealerships and, you know, other kinds of things um, that were also franchises, but fast food was by far uh, the biggest of them. 
All right. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we can leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to speak with us about your book. A fascinating topic, and hopefully everyone on the uh, webinar found it interesting. I'm sure they did. And uh, all the best on you know, your, your future work. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks for having me. And thank you to our student responders. We couldn't have done this without you. You had fantastic questions. And uh, really, thank you again. Uh, one more reminder about the three events I mentioned at the top of the, of the, the beginning of the, the meeting today. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to our website, cunyurbanfoodpolicyinstitute.org, and subscribe to our newsletter in order to get updates regarding upcoming events, new research, et cetera. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you.